Hello, I'm Bradley Sward, Associate Professor of Computer Information Systems at the College of DuPage in Glen Ellyn, Illinois. And this video is going to take a very high level look at the x86 processor, its architecture, and we'll take a little bit more look into just the pieces of a PC. So uh, starting out here, you have a basic microcomputer design. This is more of a modern modern rendition of something like this. The CPU is a big part of everything, right? The CPU, we think of the CPU as everything, but it's just one part. It is an important part, but every part is important. So we also have, you know, what do we have? We have RAM, we have memory storage units. So if you've ever put your, you know, your own computer together, you kind of know the bits and pieces that you have to purchase and how you pop them in and how you do this and that. So, you know, especially if you're a computer science major, um, you should at least do it one time. I've done it a few times. I'm not. I'm never 100% happy with it because I'm not an expert by any means. But at the end of the day, I have a cheaper computer that's more powerful than anything I could just buy right out of a store or right out of a box. So anyway, coming back. So you have mem RAM. You've got CPU. You've got I/O devices and all sorts of you know like keyboard, mice, monitors. You name it. There's all sorts of stuff going on that needs to communicate back and forth. And so the communication just is a series of wires and they're called buses when it comes to uh, computer terminology here. So everything has to work together. I mean, if, ev if everything just did what they wanted to do independently of one another, it would be complete chaos. The computer would never do what it's supposed to do. So there is a clock that's sitting on the CPU that's basically kind of like, you know, what do they call that? The, the person who's like directing the rowing at the rowing competitions, just like, you know, you know, operation, operation, or clock cycle, clock cycle. And so every time through here, every one billionth or two or three billionth of a second, the computer's doing something, and it only takes that long for the electricity to work its way through, and then we're ready to do the next operation, or at least the next, the next clock cycle's worth of work. Uh, let's see, the control unit coordinates the sequence of steps because a modern CPU isn't just running one thing at a time. A modern CPU is running multiple things at a time and trying to set up a way and trying to figure out what code is in front of it to try to try to make it as efficient and get it done as quickly as possible. And of course, all the stuff that we're basically going to talk about from this video on is basically your ALU, all the arithmetic operations that can be performed, bitwise operations, subtractions, multiplications, and copies, and you name it. That is all, that all goes there as well. So looking at this, again, the clock cycle, it's, you know, that is basically, it's three gigahertz, 3.6 gigahertz, I think is my processor, however many cores I have, I don't remember anymore, but you kind of get the point that hertz means you know, basically cycles per second, giga means billion. So your computer is performing three, three to four, or two to three or four billion clock cycles per second. And see, that's where the hertz comes in. That doesn't mean it's performing that many operations. It's just performing that many clock cycles. And we'll see here, it takes many clock cycles just to do one operation. So it, the computer is not running as fast as you imagine it is, and I hate to blow the you know blow that whole you know blow that out for you if you're thinking that way. You're not running. You're, the computer is not running 100% 100% of the time. And so, uh, and then of course, like everything else, this clock can be used to trigger events because you know because every time you're like oh this operation is complete, you can take the result and move it to where you want to go, and then you can go ahead and start bringing in new information and so forth and so on. And so as I say, it's all organized through the clock that's sitting on the CPU. So this chart does not necessarily mean much to us as programmers. Let me move myself over here. Sorry about that. See previous slide. Oh, whatever. It's all good. So let's say we, we barely scratched the surface of what computer engineering and computer, you know, all that kind of stuff, computer architecture is all about in any computer science course, because that's more of that's compute. That's different. That's a different field altogether. But a lot goes into executing one line of code. And just as I said, there's a lot going in. It's not just it happens in one frame, like one. Not, I think in video games, in one clock cycle. So like, just what is a what is an operation that needs to be performed in you know by your computer, but just a bunch of bytes sitting in your RAM that needs to be translated 
and then organize to do the work that the that the operation is trying to perform. So first off, I need to get the operation out of RAM. I need to basically use the instruction pointer and go, hey, this is operation A7. And then that means, oh, this is an add operation. So I need to figure out what operation I'm even doing. That's the decoding part. Fetch and decode. Hey, this is an add operation. Because now that I know it's an add operation or or whatever operation it is, now I know now I need to know what kind of basically parameters or operands need to su be supplied to this. And so for an add operation, I need to supply two. I need to supply basically an add operation as a plus equals operation, if you think of higher level languages. And so I need to know basically what's the left hand side and what's the right hand side of the plus equals. And so I need to fetch those operands out of RAM figure out, you know, oh, I need to I need to get X or I need to get the EAX register, which you'll we'll be talking register soon enough inside of this video. So we have to make sure we get all that information and get that ready to go and put that in and set up the and set up the uh, and operation or the, the add operation to do all the hard work. And then after all of that is finally done, then I can finally do the real work of saying, okay, go and do the actual uh, add operation and then the result has to go somewhere. So this is, you know, clock cycle after clock cycle after clock cycle, just to do one simple operation, just to add two numbers together. And so, if, and then you basically, once you've stored the operation, where the result, wherever it needs to go, I'm ready to move on and ready to do the next thing. So this is over and over and over and over again, obviously, until the program completes, hopefully, uh, hopefully completes correctly if you've done everything correctly. In, in assembly language, that gets harder and harder, but the higher level languages prevent us from making more and more catastrophic mistakes, except for C++, that one just lets you die anyway. So um, reading from memory, so just, you know, so the registers are one thing. Going back, let's see, I'm in slide five here. So that the registers that we're going to talk about are already sitting on the CPU. So I don't have to do any extra work. A register is just a, a, a funnily named uh, variable. Just we'll, we'll talk about that in a couple slides. But you see here, the registers are sitting on the CPU. So if I have, if I want to use those, it doesn't, I don't, there's no time sync involved. It's just when I need to reference memory my RAM that I need to use these wires and go out and figure out to get that information from RAM. And so this is just, you know, this is a complicated way of doing things. You know, how many different game or how many different uh, clock cycles does this take? I need to place the address of the value I want to read on the address bus. So that means like, oh, wherever X is stored in RAM, I need that memory address, put that on the bus. And then I need to change the processor's read pin, basically send out an alert that I'm, I'm ready, I'm ready to go ahead and I, I want this information from this bus. And then we have to wait one extra clock cycle because maybe somebody was already doing something on there because you know you have multi you know it's multi-threaded environment these days. So I have to wait one extra clock cycle on top of everything else. And then I can finally copy the data that's you know basically sitting on the wire that you know the information coming through and go, okay, that's the information. That's what's stored in that uh, that variable sitting out in RAM. So one clock cycle plus one clock cycle plus one, you know, how many does it take? I believe the book mentions five. I don't know. And it's hard to know because in a modern environment, the CPU is doing a lot of extra work. Sometimes it does a lot to try to simplify the process. So sometimes, sometimes even with all that simplification, it actually takes longer than you might imagine. So over the years, there have been many different ways that we've been able to you know, basically have our computer operate. So modes of operation here. So like I said, like a protected mode, it's a third, you know, so protected means exactly what you think it is. It's the more modern way of doing things. Basically, Windows 95 ushered us in officially, you know, basically the mainstream into this kind of thought process. And so back, you know, a 32-bit or a 64-bit addressing model that is native to whatever operating system we're working on. So if we're working in 32 bits, that's why we don't, that's why there was a hard cap of RAM for a while with four gigabytes of RAM, because the largest 32-bit number that you can represent using that space is 4.29 billion. So basically, memory location FFFFFFFFFF, however many eight Fs there, is basically 32-bit quantity that's 4.29 billion. So, so it's a protected mode, meaning the operating system doesn't let me just go in and just go to wherever I want in my computer and do whatever I want. That was the previous era, the DOS era, the Commodore, the Apple era, 
where you could just basically just go and do whatever you want wherever. And this is bef you know basically before networking and before there was a you know the you know the big change in paradigms to client server where basically everybody's sending information everywhere and you're trying to you know make sure this data stays secure. Because if anybody could just hack into your computer and look anywhere, I would you just pull down all the RAM, save it for later, and then go through it and find out what's going on. It, it would be a lot easier for everybody to hack what's going on. So protected mode versus real address mode. This was the old stuff here. The DOS one megabyte of memory up to, and that was the interesting going again going between 16-bit mode, 16-bit uh, processing, and 32-bit processing. There was that weird 20 to 24-bit era going on. So 20-bit addressing model with near memory and far memory, and that was when I was going through things, and no one ever explained to me what the heck it was all about, and it was confusing as all hell to me. So thank goodness that's all gone. That was like the little blip. It was pretty easy up front, and then it got hard with all this stuff, and then now it's back to easy. I just ask for memory. The computer just gives me memory. I don't have to. There's nothing special about RAM in one place versus another. So, uh, but that one megabyte of memory, and goodness gracious, you know, a couple times I made some games that really pushed the boundaries of what DOS could do. And so, and then system management mode, you know, so like, you know, the computer couldn't, didn't always turn off. Right? When, like, if I just go over and just say, you know, hey, computer, go to taskbar, shut off. The computer back in the day, back in Windows 95 era, especially when it first started, you would see that screen that said, it is now safely, you know, it's now a safe time to turn off your computer. And basically, because it, it couldn't do it automatically, you had to go physically press that button. So power management, security management, diagnostic management. And again, like if you've ever put, it, put your own PC together and you've ever seen the, you know, what your motherboard all that, all the diagnostics sitting behind the scenes that you can tweak. It's really amazing that all of that stuff goes into this kind of stuff too. So, you know, like there's a lot of tweaks again because this the motherboard is holding everything together and trying to make sure everything works. And you know, basically, and since you know RAM is you know you can have different types of RAM, different types of processors, different types of this, different types of that. It all has to communicate, and everybody has to be on the same page. So there needs to be a system management mode to handle that. So in this course, we are going to be working in a 32-bit environment. And of course, we do, obviously, you know, it's obviously 2020 and beyond now at this point. So we're working with 64-bit processors. But, you know, you're not missing out on much. So you don't, you know, like, and essentially, you're going to see in a slide or two that we're going to use a register called EAX. If I was doing this in 64-bit mode, it would be RAX. And so I discussed earlier, a couple a minute ago or so, or before even that, that you know there was a between 16-bit mode and 32-bit mode, there was a bit of a jump and a hurdle, but in more of a revolution, if you want to think of it that way, when it comes to architecture. But the move from 32 to 64, if you, you know, there have been blips, of course, but it's more of an evolution than a revolution that has occurred. So. You're not missing out on much of that experience, so don't freak out about that kind of stuff. So it, with a 64-bit processor, I can kind of flip the modes on the processor. Windows has environments where you can virtualize into 16-32 and 64-bit applications, like DOSBox and um, just those kind of things where you can run a program that's not native to 64-bit mode. And so because also of this of 64 bits of uh, addressing when it comes to the address mode, you know, like I can actually access 256 terabytes of RAM. That's, the reality is whatever 64 bits, what is it, 18, some huge number, like, what is it, 18 ter, not terabytes, petabytes or zettabytes or some weird exobytes. The computer, maybe this, this, this slideshow shows it. And it's just like, oh goodness, like you can now, instead of having four gigs of RAM, you could theoretically store up to, you know, 256 terabytes of RAM. And we laugh about that now. But in 10, 20 years, maybe we'll be laughing at someone who only has 256 terabytes of RAM. Who the heck knows what's going to happen in the future? So here we go. These are your new best friends. Let me move myself out of the way. Here are your new best friends when it comes to your life for this course. These are the general registers, the general purpose registers sitting on the CPU. And basically, every operation you perform, almost every operation, has to use one of these things to get the job done. And so, um, and each register is optimized for speed. As we discussed, they're sitting on the CPU already. 
So you don't have to do any extra information or any extra waste any time or energy to go get them from RAM or do something else with them. They're sitting on the CPU and they're almost immediate. I can almost immediately pull those values down. And so we'll see here that certain registers, you'll, this is the whole rest of the course, certain registers get used for certain tasks and certain operations. And so it becomes like a, you know, you're juggling these registers together to get stuff done. And it, it can become quite challenging. And, um, and not all registers have to be used for their purposes. So you, and again, you'll learn how you can trick the system out. But EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX, why are they just not A, B, C, D? I don't know. But, they, but that's that's our 32-bit versions of this. E, so these are what we will use for general uh, arithmetic. EBP and ESP is basically uh, stack operations, which we handle in the last couple weeks of the, of the term. ESI and EDI generally hold pointer or addressing information that are that's different than pointers to to, to memory and then or stack memory and then pointers or information stored at actual values for arithmetic. There's also flags. Well, there's you know, say we'll show the flags in a minute here. Basically, every operation flips different flags that indicate if the result was zero or a positive number or a negative number or if there was an overflow or an underflow or that kind of thing. And then this last one here, when it comes to the registers themselves, like the 32-bit registers, the EIP, the Extended Instruction Pointer. I, I equate this to like if you had like a C++ program sitting in front of you and you were running through it by hand, where you had your finger, that's the line of code that, you, that you're running right at that current moment as you're pro, you know, progressing through your program. That's essentially what the instruction pointer is, because the computer also has to keep track of which operation, which instruction it's currently performing so that it knows to go to the correct next uh, operation when that one completes. And so we have all these other segment registers. These are pure 16-bit registers. And so the only, the only three here that matter to us is code segment, stack segment, data segment. The code itself, the ones and zeros that make up all the operations, the actual physical code goes into the code segment. The stack, which we'll only touch briefly near the end of the course, that is its own thing. You can set specify how much stack space you want to set aside. And all of the global variables that you set up go, in a, go into the data segment. So global variables go into the data segment, local variables go on to the stack. And so it gets confusing. There's, there's, we all know this class, there's a lot of involvement and a lot of things going on in this course. But just understand, globals go in the data, locals will end up on the stack at the end of the day. And for until the end of the class, instead of using the stack, we'll use the registers to hold the values. And then it'll just be like magic, not really, but it'll be it'll be something when we get to the final the final chapter, chapter eight. And now we're dealing with the stack stuff. So each of the registers you see here, EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX are basically what we call a union. It's it's all of everything you see here is basically it's stored in one space. But it's just how you go ahead and reference that data is, is how it matters here. So every one of the four. So they say EAX is a full 32-bit register. So that whole thing, 32 bits of storage, four bytes of storage, and int, if you want to think of C++ or Java or whatever. So, But what happens is you can break that thing down and say, oh, I only want to use 16 bits. So that's the 16 bits on the low end of this is the AX register. So again, just kind of think of it like a collapsi collapsible thing. AX is stored inside of EAX, and AH and AL is stored is inside of here, which is the store inside of here. So it's, if I modify any one of these four things here, they, they affect each other. If I change AL, I change AX and EAX in the process because it's all the same data. And so EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX all store this. You just have to get used to this. This is 32 bits. This is the low 16 bits. And of those 16 bits, this is the low 8 and the higher 8. And this just comes back down to just, you know, reverse, you know, reverse engineering and just, uh, and just over the years, the architecture started out in a 16-bit environment. And this is how things worked. And then we just, you know, plopped the 32-bit stuff on top of that. And then we later on plopped the 64-bit on top of everything else. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel and re-architect all of this stuff if it already works. And because, and then you'd have to change all the code that was written in the years prior when you changed your processor. 
So if you want that, use a different processor. So, you know, that's what the x86 is all about. This thing's been around for many, many, many years. They keep adding new stuff, but it all works together in the end. So then here you can see here, it just to kind of show it, I'm not used to running this through here where you can actually, where it actually is fancy. So EAX is AX, AH, AL, B, EBX has BX, BH, BL. Just changes, just change the A's with B's, C's, and D's, and you get the point here is what I'm saying. And so there are four different registers, 128 bits of storage that are yours to use however you see fit as long as you understand how this thing works out. Okay, so for the other four registers up there, ESI, EDI, EBP, and ESP, there's only a 16-bit version. There is no 32-bit version of any of this stuff. So there's SI, DI, BP, and SP, and as you see, there's the low 16, but you can't go in and get, get me the high end or the low end of that register. If you need that, you would have to do, you would have to do those operations yourself. Move that value into one of those other registers and then be able to do that. But there's no reason, because generally speaking, ESI, e, these four guys, if you know, are holding pointers to something. So there's no such thing on this processor as an 8-bit pointer. There are 8-bit processors, but this is not one of them. So there's, as far as the architecture goes, there's no need to work our way down to have 8 bits of storage for these things stored because they're just going to be pointers anyway. Okay, so then other parts here, there's MMX and XMM. I don't know if that's just a funny joke or anything like that when it comes to other registers. These are things we are never going to cover in this course. SIMD extensions to the instruction set. There are a whole ton of things. We are just, you know, as hard as this class ends up being and challenging, we are just scratching the surface when it comes to what this processor can do. You know, we're not touching floating point operations. We're not touching any of that high, the high end stuff here. But there are uh, eight MMX registers in the 64 bit, and there are eight 128 bit XMM registers that can do all sorts of multimedia communications and all sorts of stuff. You know, much more complicated stuff than we're handling here. All right, so again, we talked about the registers, but now here we're talking about the flags. So again, every operation that gets performed with an exception or two affects the flags. So the first four are the big ones, five and six, auxiliary carry and parity flag, we're never gonna touch. That's generally used for computer networking, trying to determine if I'm sending information over an internet or over a network that the information got from point A to point B correctly. So basically error checking. And so you can do uh, you know, all sorts of stuff with that. But every other operation that, we, that we're gonna matter, especially comparisons and things like that, we care about the carry flag, the overflow, the sign, and the zero flag. And so like a zero flag, did the result result in a zero? If I took five minus five, I get a zero. That means that both values were the same. If A and B are the same, a subtraction would name their, mean they're equal to zero, I could check the zero flag. If the sign flag is set, that means that it's a negative number. The result was negative. If it's a if it, if it gets cleared, then it was not. It's it's got to be a positive number. And then, like you say, have you ever done where you ever have an overflow? You had like for you have a byte of storage. You get two fifty five. You add one, and now you're back to zero. You're like that's not how things are supposed to go. But in eight bits of storage, we can only hold up to two fifty five. So there would be an overflow from that, and these flags would handle that situation very well for us. We will see these quite a few times. We don't ever truly play with them. We indirectly use them for our operations, but you'll see that we generally do not go in and directly ask, hey, what's the status of the carry flag? Or what's the status of the sign flag? Or anything like that. Okay, so motherboards, you know, so if, I do highly recommend if you ever get a chance to put your own together because you just learned so much and you spend a lot of money and you freak out thinking you broke everything until it finally works. Oh my goodness, that first time like spending all that money, flipping the switch, putting it all together, and then nothing happened. Wondering, did I just blow a thousand dollars? Because you don't know. Yeah, and then just, just working it out a little better and going, oh, hey, um, yeah, I forgot to plug this in or I forgot to do that and get that going. I make it sound horrible. Things have improved greatly. I have my skills have definitely decreased when it comes to working in hardware. But the, about a year ago or so, I put this computer together and everything's working great. So uh, my, you know, over the last five or six years, it, things have gotten much easier when it comes to just popping all the pieces in. But what have I got here on the motherboard? And here is just an old, old example here. And you, this is a $4 motherboard you can get or even probably cheaper nowadays. Who the heck knows? But you can say all these things. You can put RAM. Where's your, here's your, you jam your RAM in here. This is where your, 
This is where your uh, CPU goes. Your video cards go over here. You, all the little extra wires for power. Video card goes over here. If I didn't already mention that, but anyway, just you know, and then everything else goes with it, right? And everything pop, 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 pop. And nowadays, it's very simple to kind of get things going. Follow the instructions, and everything works just as simple as you could ever imagine. And so, so now one of the big revolutions. When did this occur? Probably 2005 or so. It's been about 15 years now. Moving from an old cathode cathode ray tube technology monitor. Remember, those, I definitely had one of those huge monitors or huge television. You know, basically shooting, uh, rasterizing everything to the screen versus today's LCD displays. I'm staring at two LCD monitors. All our all our technology is now LCD and quantum dot this and that and OLED and all these things and completely different ways of rendering pictures to the screen. Raster scanning with an electron gun versus every pixel is can be maintained at any given moment in time under over that refresh rate. Completely different ways of doing things. And so, like, like the old video games kind of don't look as good on modern television sets because the artistry of it was trying to get the game to look as good on those crappy televisions as opposed to now where everything is just crystal clear. So sometimes a little bit gets lost and sometimes they actually do add filters to the emulators so that it looks a little bit more like uh, the, old, the old time stuff. So to say video cards can handle all this stuff so we don't have to worry about it. So one of these things, a TV card, right? We just get so, we're so spoiled, right? We can just go Netflix and you name it, right? Like 20 years ago, my goodness, right? You couldn't even, you could barely text someone 20 years ago. And now I could be sitting almost in the middle of nowhere and I could just pull down and watch the newest episode of whatever the heck I want to watch. But back in the day, of course, this is the, you know, this is the, uh, <laughs> this is my back in my time kind of part of the lecture here that I had one of these things so you could, you know, put a TV into it and you could record TV basically through your computer this and now and now look at me what what, are we, what am i doing now i'm making a video i've got camcorders and all sorts of technology working and it's like nothing but uh, so many people had to work so hard to get us to this spot so i'm very very happy that those people did all that work for us over the years so that it's it feels like nothing to get this stuff working different types of memory so how many different types of memory are there, right? Like how, a memory is just some, some way of storing data that a computer can access. So there's ROM, CD-ROM, DVDs. Do we even, I don't even have a, I don't even have a system. I don't even have a, a CD or DVD system on my computer anymore. It's freaky. Years ago, I would have killed to have a DVD burner. And by the time they were finally accessible and affordable, nobody used them anymore. Now we're downloading everything. The cloud is as big as it is, but that's a way to store data. Uh, EPROM, think of video game cartridges like the old days, like the Nint original Nintendo, Super Nintendo, not so much PlayStation stuff, but any of those old cartridges that you see around. Um, dynamic RAM, static RAM, video RAM, 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 just, you know, all sorts of stuff. There's different ways to do it. And all of those different ways, you know, it, it takes different technologies and it takes a different amount of time to be able to get the information to that source or off that source. Or in some cases, like the ROMs read only memory. I can read from it, but I can't write to it. So there's, you know, there's drawbacks. And so like, let's see, one type that I ended up using back way back in my day, back when I worked in casino industry was basically, a, we called it non-volatile RAM, but it's basically just battery backup RAM like you would have for like the, the original Zelda or something like that, where your game would be saved after you turn off the computer or turn off the, the video game system. Because as you can imagine, if the power went out and you had $300 sitting in the slot machine, you'd like... When the power came back on, you would like to be able to have your three hundred dollars back. I think that's. I think we can all speak for that, right? So, when we're talking about that kind of stuff, it makes sense. It, it, but it all depends on the technology. It all depends on the application. What is your system? What are you trying to use? USB ports every single time, right? This. <laughs> hopefully, one of these days, I can actually put these things in right the first time. We're up to USB at least three at this point. And so USB ports ports have been around for at least 25 years now. So there used to be all sorts of different stuff. Now everything is just USB, USB, or even Wi-Fi, right? Printers used to be on, what is that? I don't even, what is that thing called? Parallel port, LST, LSP, I, I forget what the heck the, or I forget what the name of the port is because I'm just talking and thinking too much while I'm trying to talk to you guys. But a parallel port versus a serial port. 
like all these different por ports that used to exist on their computer has been replaced with just the USB that does everything. And the parallel port would handle the printing, and it would be exactly pure parallel, meaning you could basically only send information one at a time versus serial, where you could send multiple things at one time. And um, and just to finish up here, now we have all sorts of different types of wires. I say parallel, different kind of interfaces, right? And Apple always coming up with their own lightning and Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and FireWire and serial ATA and all this other stuff. I'm um, just flying through it because it doesn't much matter. But just understand that, like, like I always thought, you know, one day we'd have one monitor or, or one resolution that everyone can handle. I don't know why we have so many different ones. Just got an ad today for different monitors with 17 different resolutions. I'm like, can't we just agree that it's 10, you know, 1080p and 1440p and, and 4K and 8K and then we just call it a day. At a certain point, we're not going to need you know, a 64K resolution on a monitor. We're not going to be able to notice that. So I don't know where, we're, but anyway. So serial, here's serial ports. Uh, when I was a senior in college, my final project, I was working on something that could communicate with scientific uh, chemistry devices. So the RS-232 port would send information. I would have to get that information and then decode it on the other end. And so I had to make sure I could communicate with all these devices. And it was 20 years ago. And so it was, it was rather hard. Let me say, a lot of things are a lot easier these days. There's a lot better interfaces for everything. Um, and in 20 years, we'll say the same thing. 20 years ago, everything was so hard, and now it's so easy. But this, that's just the way life goes. So that covers everything I wanted to cover. This is a pretty low-key discussion here. Not a lot that you have to worry about for this course, but just stuff that you should just know in general. You know, nothing... Now you should know how a computer operates. You should know its component parts. You don't have to know it like the back of your hand. But if you have a conversation with a computer engineer and they're talking about this stuff, you should you should be able to kind of at least understand a few of the words that come out of their mouth. But anyway, uh, if you have any questions about this video or anything else, swordb at cod.edu is a great way to get a hold of me. As always, you can send a comment down here on my YouTube channel or get a hold of me if uh, COVID finally finishes up. Get a hold of me on campus or some other way. Find me. Ask those questions. Do not sit on them. That's the only way that you'll get more confused as we push on into this course is if you do not understand and you don't ask questions. So from this, the most important part of this lecture, this is just me getting off my soapbox and yelling at the clouds. The, the most important part of this is the flags and the registers. That Getting just getting used to these the, the names of these things and what they are and what they do That is a big plus and that's why it's part of the the first exam is so that you just you know Before we even discuss how they all operate at least you know what they are and you know from there We can we can work toward that. All right, so I'm done blabbing with all that stuff Thanks for sticking with us. Have a great day everybody. We'll see you next time